My guest today is Steve Mildenhall, principal at Convex Risk, a former assistant professor of actuarial science at St. John's University and former CEO of analytics at Aon. Today we are talking about the history of the macro environment of the insurance market as part of a course Steve is designing on pricing insurance risk. Steve is also writing a book about pricing insurance risk with John Major due out this fall. Steve, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me again. So we're talking about the history of, of insurance, the macro environment of insurance. And I think that we're going to go so far back in history, I think, which I'm really excited about. But it's worth asking the question, why bother? What can we learn? So that's a, that's a great question. And let's just see how far back are we going to go here. Um, I got this chart that shows uh, the ratio of property casualty premium to GDP all the way back to 1923. And um, partly I did this simply because I could. Uh, I, when I was at St. John's, I got a wonderful insurance library, the Davis Library, and it has all of the AM Best books, uh, all the aggregates and averages books, and you just it was simply there. I had had this chart previously backed, I think the 1968 is reasonably easy to come by, and I was just like, huh, I wonder what happened you know, before then. And so I was just motivated just, to, just because it was there and I loved data and I wanted to see what it looked like. But in terms of what, you know, what's the point, what can we get out of this? Insurance is data driven, right? It's all about the losses. And statistics like this shed a lot of light on the structure, the management, the evolution of the uh, insurance industry. And as, you know, as, we, as we look at it, this, this type of thing is sort of electronically and easily available back to 1996. Um, and you see a lot of studies that, you know, therefore they, they use that data. And, and I felt like, well, you know, I personally, I started in the industry in 92. And for those around then, that was Hurricane Andrew, which was a huge, huge deal. And then you had 94 was Northridge. And I, I, I got to get back to 92. Um, and then, you know, keep going back. We, we want insurance companies to run and make good on their promises for, you know, 25, 50, 100 years, you need a long-term time history to, to sort of get the requisite set of events in there that you can you can truly sort of test against. So there's a whole lot of data-driven reasons why this sort of thing is going to be interesting. And, and, you know, I can't help but say, as I look at the graph, that Northridge, Hurricane Andrew, even if you skip ahead to Hurricane Katrina, they just don't matter. I mean... Talk about irrelevant. How disappointing, right? For the amount of like the amount of ink that is spilled over these very you know prominent catastrophe events, totally irrelevant. <laughs> I would say yeah, in macro I mean, history. Uh, great, great point. And yeah, I just uh, overlaid a few a few events here to sort of see what what seems to matter and what what doesn't matter. You can see there was a little tiny blip after Andrew, but it was part of a down, down, down after the LMX spiral in the in the nineteen eighties. Um, you know, oil crisis was something. Harvey, actually, at the end there, you know, 2017, Harvey, Irv, uh, Irma and Maria had a sort of fairly significant uh, uptick. Obviously, the Second World War had an uptick. But, yeah, a lot of these events that are sort of so huge as you live through them maybe didn't move the dial necessarily on this macro view. Yeah, and, and you also get the idea, the sense of scale of a hard market, right? So the... The, the, ver the, the slope of the vertical line and the length of that vertical line tells you real how awful it was. And I, I, I was, as I was looking at this too, I mean, I, I could probably talk about this very graph all day, but uh, I remembered a, a podcast interview I did with, um, um, gosh, what was his name? Um, Paul Ingray. Ugh, Paul Ingray. And Paul Ingray told me the story about like 1982 and 83. And he talked about how he was having to double the premium on a particular policy and uh, raise its deductible. I think it was an excess policy or something like that uh, by like five million bucks, right? And then, and then sort of making up prices. So I mean, right, you know, an actuary, while right, you're thinking like, okay, so if I double the premium and I increase the deductible, like, you know, how rate adequate am I? I mean, I don't know. You got to throw out the book, right? And then, then that policy still lost money. And so you have this like period of a, what we describe as a very hard market but down the uh, down down the slope, we continue to go. Uh, I mean, think of the, the agony, and that's also a period too where um, where GDP uh, nominal GDP is rising pretty fast because of inflation. Uh, so you kind of have you know the numbers all over the place, and I mean, and you see the consequences at the end at that bottom where he says LMX spiral, which I would think is probably a a result, not a cause of the hard market, right? That was kind of like 
the end, the beginning, or the end of the beginning. That was the, yeah, the trigger. I mean, th th this period here is just remarkable. If you look at this, you're, you're moving over a percentage point of the entire economy <laughs> moved nuts. into the PNC sector nuts. in two years. It's just astonishing, right? Yeah. And, then, yeah, yeah, you know, and you had, so all sorts of things happened in 86, you know, absolute pollution exclusion, claims made form, there was tax reform and what have you, that sort of changed a lot of the dynamics. But there was a huge hole here that people needed to dig out of. And, and you know, your story about Paul um, doubling the premium, the, the thing that you don't see from this is, and, I, you know, I experienced this in the sort of po post-World uh, Trade Center, much smaller hard market that happened after 01. People were doubling the premium, raising the deductible, and lowering the limit, right? So yeah. that, that this doesn't really capture necessarily the sort of unit cost of uh, uh, seeding risk into the insurance market, maybe as clearly as it could. Yeah, and, you know, think like the scale there again. So let's look at the early 2000s. You had one of those in the mid 70s, a hard market of a similar scale to right, that, that one. That was um, the, so you had a huge stock market decline that happened after the oil crisis, 73, 74, we'll see later on, there's actually a low point for uh, surplus adequacy for the, for the uh, industry. And then there were uh, liability issues, I think it was a med mal crisis then. Um, so I, in fact, that one looked a little more maybe like the, the WTC kind of mm -hmm. disaster that was sort of reserve uh, driven. And then you had inflation sort of picking up during that time. I'm sure people, you know, discovered that they were somewhat under reserved uh, as well. And you know, I'm also struck as I, you know, I, I mean, Steve, when you first showed me this graph, I was just like big smile on my face because I've seen the ones, and I have actually in various presentations over the years tried to recreate the one you were talking about, the AM best one that goes back, I think you said to the '60s. And I was always like, man, that's so cool. We can go back. I wonder if we can go back farther. And here you've done it. And then you look, what do you learn? The 1920s had the biggest hard market of all. Right. I mean, there you go more than a, you know, percentage two and one and a half percentage points of GDP from 1922 to, let's like, say, 1930. Well, so maybe. Yeah. Right. I, I think the other interpretation there is that that was the beginnings of the insurance industry. You know, automobiles were sort of coming online. Mm. And really, I think that 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 piece was probably more reflective of more things being insured. Interesting. Right? So. Workers' comp laws, I think I looked up, I think, uh, like, Liberty Mutual was founded, I think, in the sort of teens, I think. Yes, State Farm and, as well, yes. Right. So, and, and they were in direct response to workers' compensation laws coming into, into play, where, you know, employers there had to, had to provide this coverage for their, uh, for their workers. So probably a lot of that 20s uh, boom was actually more insurance, right? And, yeah. and then you sort of see the same thing. I think, yeah, so then you have the Great Depression, which obviously not sure it changes everything. And your Second World War, probably people aren't running around suing one another. So much of the economy is militarized at that point that, you know, normal rules of insurance probably don't apply. But I, I think the period sort of from about 1950 up through, and you can, in fact, if I drop the line on the next page, you know, you, you've got this long period from sort of just after the Second World War, let's call it into the sort of mid-1990s, where... Um, the, there was a sort of in, the industry was on the finding coverage front foot, if you will, and, and so I remember yeah. reading that like Hank Greenberg's uh, book about uh, AIG. Yep, he describes being in the late '60s, and you know, new DNO uh, lawsuits were coming up, sort of new uh, uh, mechanisms for sort of finding people liable, and he talked about you know wanting to find coverage to sort of stand behind those um, those potential talks. And and so there was potentially, you know, there was an expansion of coverage there. It was a period of enormous economic growth. And it was a sort of fairly industrialized growth, right? That you had, you know, there was a lot of big pieces of machinery moving around and that tends to cause damage and, and sort of require insurance. So I think that period, and I, you know, the watershed probably was 86. There's another version I've, I've got of this. I don't have it here, where I look at losses that are sort of seeded into the industry. And they're almost V-shaped. They go up until 86, and then they kind of come down on, hmm. on the other side. And part of that is uh, the way the tax code used to be written prior to 86, you, got, you basically got a deduction for your underwriting loss. And if you made investment income, that was all good. And then in 86, they changed it so that you got taxed basically on a sort of operating income basis, right? You have to discount for, for um, tax purposes. And so that made it less advantageous to just kind of push stuff through the insurance industry, which I think pulled 
uh, you know, a lot of business out. And then in addition, there was, a, there was you know, asbestos and environmental were sort of really, beco people were really becoming aware of those. You had the Lloyd's uh, crisis going on. And people maybe moved away from this, hey, how do we find coverage? To now it was, oh, I want to restrict coverage, right? Absolute pollution exclusion, you could argue claims made form was, was kind of a, an attempt to do that. And the industry made, moved on to a sort of more defensive posture in terms of uh, trying to you know, ex expand its offerings. Yeah, I'll say, boy, there's a lot there. I, I want, can we just talk for a second about the detail of your point there about the change in the tax law? So you're, I, I think that the sentiment you're expressing is that companies were less loss averse. They are more willing to make underwriting losses because there's a tax advantage to that. They could deduct that from their tax bill. Is that, do I have that right? Yeah, so I, I started working at a company that had a very complicated net present value um, calculation that incorporated all the tax uh, and and I, I'm not sure exactly where it stood, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, sort of tax reform. But certainly at one point, there was a sort of, you know, it was almost like the more money you lost, the more money you made because you made it up on the tax benefit. So there was, you could write stuff at a big underwriting loss. And obviously, let's not forget here, early 80s, right, you could buy treasuries and they were yielding yeah. 10 to 15%, right? right. Investment income was huge. Right I mean, yeah. investment income was a serious thing back then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, there was, a, there was a lot of kind of cash flow underwriting, as it's called, because you could make so much money on the, on the investment piece and the, and the tax uh, code was uh, favorable to that. And, and I think that another thing that, that I was, you know, sort of fascinated by is, you know, during, your, during the period of your orange line, you have, I think that what you're kind of alluded to there is a lot of, uh, let's call it uh, legal entrepreneurship, right? Where we are, I mean, the, the court system is redefining pretty deep kind of like, I mean, moral code of a society, right? Where you're saying who's responsible for what? And you, like you mentioned, strict liability, where now the, the, the duty of care that certain, you know, let's think of like medical malpractice, right? Where now you can sue a doctor because the procedure went wrong. Whereas before it was, you know, it was like best effort required or something. United States, of course, being a bit of an outlier in, in how strict the liability is here. Uh, but that'll happen then too. So we're sort of discovering new uses for insurance. Um, yeah. which is something that, you know, a lot of insurance executives these days um, would love to do, right? Innovating in insurance, we all want to find new products. But I imagine it was pretty scary, uh, yeah. uh, you know, that period. And look at that. I mean, look at that. And, and, you know, also during this period, you had people went from, I don't know what car ownership was immediately after the Second World War, but I'm imagining, you know, probably less than sort of one car per household on average to more than one car per household, you know, by the end of the period. You know, the average size of a home increased uh, significantly over this period. So there's, there's just a, a massive amount of more stuff that needed protection by insurance as well. I don't think it was it wasn't just the, the sort of legal piece, but that obviously was very important for certain lines of business. Yeah. And I think that maybe this preview is some so we'll, we'll move to perhaps next. But you, there are clearly different eras. Right. So we're looking at like the, the, the macro environment has been, you know, very different in different phases of history. Yeah, I, I mean, th this one, I, one more thing just to comment on this is that, um, you know, this sort of idea of the underwriting cycle that I think everybody, you know, that we all sort of buy into this concept yeah. of the underwriting cycle. And if you, if you think, take the cycle to be the sort of deviation from the orange line here, it's pretty clear that, you know, for a very long period of time, there was, there was a cycle, right? I mean, it just oscillates nicely up and down sort of either side of that line, getting, getting kind of more and more... Um, <laughs> More, more and more extreme as, uh, as, as time goes on. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's interesting to look at that cycle and sort of decompose it a little bit. Now here we fall back to now I'm going to, anything I have where I have line of business detail, it, it, it begins unfortunately in 1992. I've got, I need to type it in and it takes, it seems to take about three hours per year to sort of type these numbers in. So I spent a long time typing in 92, 3, 4, and 5 to get myself back to 92, and this is as far back I go. But here, here's the cycle, you know, that, so this this green uh, on the right here is is kind of the last, uh, it's it's the, you know, it's the down and up from here, right? So that's, that's what we're looking at there. And um, what we see a few things here. One is, um, we can split this into personal and commercial. Now I have the line of business. So personal is basically personal auto and homeowners, the farm owners is in there. And then commercial is essentially everything else. And so you see from this that the cycle tends to be much more of a commercial lines phenomenon than a personal lines phenomenon. There's a little bit of a cycle and it's sort of interesting how it's, it's um, correlated, right? Given that they are sort of largely 
separate markets with separate players and sort of separate issues as you think about that. But um, you know, the, the, the top to bottom, the peak to trough here is is maybe two point, you know, two tenths of a point. The peak to trough here, you know, six tenths of a point, right? So sort of a three x uh, a delta. And I think you know, the, the late what you had in the late nineteen nineties was a sort of overall period of magical thinking, if you will, in financial services. You know, you've got Enron and what have you. I mean, everyone just sort of they forget that you know. The, <laughs> expected losses just add up unless you take unless you do something structurally to take something out of the system you can't just bundle it all together and magically make losses you know disappear um, and then there was a lot of reliance on investment income here you know the roaring stock market in the late uh, 90s it had been going on for quite a while sort of depressed uh, premiums so we see a little bit of a swing on, on the personal line side but obviously we see you know substantially more of a swing on the on the commercial line side and then the other thing that we, we, we see that, that's now sort of interesting here is that it's been incredibly stable, it, you know, going back sort of, you know, if we look at the broader picture here, sort of back eight, nine, you know, 10 plus years, that certainly this period down here from what's sort of like nine to about 16, that was a very long period. There's, there isn't a sort of comparable period when you look back in history that was as stable as that. And then, you know, this, the, the dot I've got here for 2020 is a little bit of an estimate. The GDP number has come out, but the insurance number won't come out for, for a few more months yet. But it's pretty easy to guess where insurance is going to come out from the third quarter number, which is what this is based on. Um, and this, this, this uptick is actually a little bit of an illusion, obviously, because GDP was lower in 2020 because of COVID. Mm -hmm. And if you take, if you, if you had allowed... GDP to grow at the same rate, you know, for 2020 over 19 as it did 19 over 18, this point for 2020 would actually be flat. So it's it's almost entirely um, the a of, of lower uh, GDP rather than increased rates. So we're still in a very, very sort of stable period, which le leads you to wonder, you know, are we kind of out of the out of the cycle business now? Um, and, you know, there's arguments on, on either side of that. I'll tell you one thing that comes to mind as I look at this, which is that's a fascinating point, and I, uh, I think I'll try and come back to that in a second, but through this piece. But one thing that is the case of personal over commercial is that rates are much more restricted, right? So you have more filing, more regulation, less flexibility to uh, increase, and one would imagine decrease rates. I'm not totally sure about that. Definitely increasing rates is harder. So, But I think if you go back to that last graph, the prior graph with the historical sweep, uh, one thing you also see as the amplitude of the cycle increases, you see rate liberalization, right? So you see like the super strict rate before the Southeastern Underwriter case that went to the Supreme Court um, that, uh, that basically destroyed this, this well, for a moment, um, or nearly destroyed the state regulation of insurance when federal, right, where you had these effectively cartels, pricing cartels, all designed to, I mean, I, the irony, and I, I just never tire of saying this, the irony in, uh, of uh, insurance regulation is it's there to protect the insurers, not the insureds, <laughs> the solvency <laughs> regulation um, against themselves, of course, we're giving too good of a deal to their customers. Um, and you can, you can predict then, you know, there's two sides of the debate, one would say, of rate liberalization, where on the one hand, they'll say, liberalize rates because you're going to improve the deal for customers. And then the other side says, don't liberalize rates because you're going to uh, screw customers, right, the, the exploitation. And it uh, turns out both are right, <laughs> and they can be right because you have a cycle where you are intermittently uh, giving customers too good of a deal and then a really bad deal, and that, that marks the amplitude of the cycle. Right. I mean, the, the industry is sort of like a giant retro rating plan, right? I mean, rates have to be prospective, but obviously your estimate of future rates is based on your recent experience. And so, yeah, it's, it's a broadly sort of self-normalizing process over time. Yeah. And, and like one thing that an idea I've toyed with, I don't think anybody agrees with me, but I'm going to keep talking about it, is that, you know, if you look at that that kind of, you know, the, the great stagnation, let's call it, or the, the great de-risking of the, of the 2000s, the kind of latter half of the 2000s, um, that flat period you're talking about there. Uh, you know, I tend to pose this point, put, make this point as a question, which is to say, do you think that technology has zero impact on an insurance company's ability to manage risk? And some people will say, well, no, of course, it has some impact on the ability for insurance companies to manage risk. And then I would say that, well, then wouldn't a dramatic improvement in information technology result in better risk management in insurance companies? And the answer probably would be yes, although you're going to have to disagree with all of this, Steve. Um, and then, then you would, what would you see if you had a giant improvement in risk management technology? A flat curve. What do you think about that argument? 
there's there's a lot of a lot of things there. Um, so risk, we'll we'll get we're going to get onto discussing risk because um, that's my kind of favorite topic here. But broadly, um, the, I, I think so. We've got asset risk. Let's kind of take that off the off to the side because that's sort of a background noise almost for for our processes here. As we think about underwriting risk, there's sort of three levels to it. Um, there's I know what the price should be, but the actual results I get are way different from what I expect. Okay, and that's basically catastrophe risk, right? If I'm <laughs> writing a Florida homeowner's book of business, I might have exactly the right rate for the hundred year average, but next year, holy cow, it's gonna be, you know, way off what what it should be. So we've got that sort of event risk level. Then there's a, a, a risk which is I'm pretty sure I know what the price should be, but I can't necessarily get it in the market. And I yeah. think a lot of what we see here with the cycle is reflective of that second type of pricing uh, risk. Um, and in, in fact, I think that you know the industry is sort of reasonably competitive. Um, and it, what that competition does is it kind of forces companies right to the edge of what they can credibly price, right? Yep. There's always an incentive to take any, if you've got a, some sort of classification rate making plan, to take that cell and divide it up, right? Yep. And people kind of keep dividing until at some level, they're kind of reading the tea leaves, right? And that sort of introduces more risk for you. Yes. Because now you have to worry, you know, in the old days where everyone was on ISO, you didn't have to worry about your plan being selected against by someone else's plan. Today, you do need to worry about that. And that's a different um, different dynamic maybe than we've, we've had in the past. And then, you know, the third level of risk, obviously, is I don't actually know what the premium should be. Um, so this is the problem we have, like, with a new coverage like cyber, for example, where people are really sort of grappling with, well, you know, what, what, should, the, what should the price for that uh, coverage be? And we tend to be very conservative about that as an industry for sort of obvious reasons that you could stack up a pretty big bet there and, you know, end up discovering that, in fact, that, you know, you weren't charging the right premium for it. So then would you say that the, our ability to manage our own pricing risk? So what is your explanation for the flat curve? You know, I say, I say well, I mean, I, I wouldn't say I don't assign 100% probability of this being true. Let's call it, I don't know, I think I 60% believe this, but that the, 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 flat, the flat curve in the 2000s is the result of improved measurement technology. So companies are able to check themselves more effectively from going over the cliff and dropping their rates too far. So I think, yeah, I would say there's probably two major contributors to that. One is um, rate monitoring came in in a really big way after 2001, right? If, yep. if you go back and you read conference calls from like the late 1990s, I don't think anyone was talking about rate monitoring. I mean, they were where they should have been. And in fact, I mean, it was amusing, right? If you were like pricing at that point, Every, you, you could do an index of how soft the market was. It was directly proportional to how stupid people thought ISO and NCCI was, right? <laughs> oh, these rates are ridiculous. I can't possibly get these rates in the market. And it didn't seem to occur to everyone. It's like, hey, they've got all the data, and it's not that difficult to set the overall rate level. Maybe those rates are actually about right, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and that turned out to be the case. So if you look, you look at work comp, particularly in, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, it basically went from everyone was credit, crediting the rates to everyone was debiting the rates. The actual loss cost really didn't move, you know, very much at all. So yeah. people knew what the rates were, but they sort of chose not to monitor it. That became entirely unacceptable post sort of 9-11. You got your very transparent, you know, Bermuda, uh, Newco started up, reinsurance got stripped out of uh, multi-line companies. And, and there was just a sort of overall increase in transparency of the business. And there was an expectation from investors that, hey, I want you to start reporting on rate. And that became a really big deal. People started started doing that. So I think that people were, that was one part of it. I think the other part of it is the improvement in the technology for getting capital into the industry, right? Mm -hmm. the, the part of the explanation for why we had cycles in the past was it was always difficult to deploy capital into the industry. And that... The, the transformation in that that's happened over the last sort of 25 years has just been enormous. Right? I don't know the, the first sort of cap bonds, you know, the USAA res re bonds that they did in what sort of 95, 96, they probably took them two years or something to get the first one done. And, you know, and then it took a long time to do those issues. 
I haven't heard what the latest is, but I imagine now you could probably get the whole thing done in a month, right? And you can probably set a new co-op basically in a month. If you've got the management team, getting the money is easy. There's a lot of people who are sort of sitting around the edge of the insurance industry looking for that opportunity to invest. And I think that sort of availability of capital kind of puts the, the, the cap on the race. And that, that's interesting because what we've seen Yo, just recently, why was HIM and brush fires and California wildfires and all that, why has that been a big deal and sort of trap capital in the collateralized markets and whatnot? I think in part, it's maybe the first time we've had people pausing and feeling like the cap models and this sort of idea that, you know, hey, we really know and understand this risk has been challenged. And maybe we need to think about, well, you know, do, particularly with the wildfires, do you know? Do how well can we can we model that? How well can we keep that in control? Is global warming having some sort of macro effects here that's actually going to be observable on the sort of insurance uh, timeframes? And is maybe cause people just to sort of become a little more leery about deploying capital into that space? Well, I, I would like. I, I feel the urge to tell a story, or tell a version of that story that doesn't include property cap, right? Because I feel like I'm convinced myself. We're looking at your data that property cap doesn't matter for cycle management. And maybe you're telling me, you might tell me, well, that's a consequence of the innovation. Uh, maybe you'd be right. I think Hurricane Andrew there being such a minor non-event uh, to me is really amazing. And so, but I think it might still be true that your point about innovation and, and, and deploying capital into the insurance industry, because I think that, and here's a question for you since you've been at it a little longer than me, uh, has reinsurance generally become more important? Because from the stories I hear anyway, the reinsurance business before, say, the 90s was a little bit more of a cottage industry dominated by Lloyd's and a few kind of domestic markets. And the diversity of reinsurers and, I mean, as a result of the enormous profits reinsurers made at the turn of the millennium after 9-11, perhaps allowed even liability lines to, to gain their access to more capital and perhaps reinsurers' ability to raise capital and deploy it into even casualty because there's no greater capital vehicle for insurance than the quota share, the mighty quota share because now you can increase your book enormously. Uh, and, and the reinsurance organizations, perhaps because they're just smarter or because of some other innovation, or even the monitoring is so good, now they're able to be better at, at monitoring insurance companies that even on liability lines, we've experienced more um, liquidity of capital. What do you think? So I think uh, some of what you're talking about, I, I obviously haven't had my finger on the pulse since sort of 2016 when I, I started teaching. Um, but I would say, I think the story from 2000 to say 20, you know, the mid teens was slightly different than that. I think that coming out of 9 11, you actually had a catastrophic failure of communication between the primary companies and the reinsurance companies, and it essentially killed a massive amount of casualty reinsurance. Right. Uh, because what happened was, um, there was this disconnect where insurance companies looked at their book and they're like, I'm running, you know, a 120, 30, whatever it is on this liability book. I really need to rein that in, you know, raise deductibles, lowered limits, jack rates up, truly fix that book of business. And somehow they were not able to credibly explain that to the reinsurers. And as a result, you can, you can look at the sort of mix of, of sessions from sort of 01, 02, through you know 05, 06, and that market shifted to property in a quite a remarkable, uh, quite a remarkable way because reinsurance and, and particularly alternative capital truly is a, a way better way of bearing that outside cat risk. Right? If you've got a, I think of it as sort of like a spiky risk on your balance sheet, and cat is the ultimate spiky risk as opposed to sort of a you know plus or minus ten point sort of volatility kind of a swing. Um, it, it's very inefficient to bear that with equity capital because equity capital is really expensive for, for a whole host of reasons that investors don't want to give insurance companies sort of permanent uh, capital. And so if you can find something like you've got with alternative capital where you're accessing a different set of investors, but you're, you're accessing them with a vehicle that addresses a lot of the concerns that people have around equity capital, right? So why don't people like equity capital it's a long-term commitment into a regulated industry. I've got double taxation. I've got a trust management. It's a very opaque product. I've got no independent view of the pricing. Look at what a cap bond does. A cap bond strips out all of those problems, every single one, right? 
you ride it in a low regulation, no tax jurisdiction, you've got cap bonds, gives you an independent view of the pricing, you're only giving them capital for two or three years and then you get it back because it's a, it's a bond. You don't have to trust management because your, your cap bond hasn't got management, there's essentially no moral hazard, I mean, it's, just, it's brilliant. So this explains why alternative capital can come in with a much, much lower cost of capital than equity capital and, and be really the perfect vehicle for uh, siphoning off that risk that is uneconomic for you to bear on, uh, on your equity-based uh, insurance balance sheet. And whether that gets done you know, directly to a cap bond or it gets kind of transformed through a reinsurer, or reinsurers have a sort of slightly different mix of um, uh, investors and they sort of address some of those concerns. You know, they can address the taxation and they can address the regulation uh, pieces and they can be sort of more transparent like the Bermuda companies were. Um, so I, I think it, it, has a, it had a huge and transformative impact on the property side. Fortunately, at the same time, the casualty just killed, it just shot itself in the foot because the reinsurers would just be like, oh, you know, I, I still think your book sucks like it did in the late 1990s and I'm not going to believe any of these things that you tell me you've done. And like, well, the primary companies were like, well, I know I've done them and if you can't give me better deals than this on this quarter share, I'm taking it net. And that's what happened. It was an enormous shift of business away from casualty and into property. Yeah, and, and I, I think that I'm going to keep trying to push this story, which I think, I think we're going to agree on this, I think, where I think the rate monitoring technology gives a, let's call it analogous, if not quite as effective, a benefit to reinsurers or other monitoring entities. Uh, because I remember beginning of my career, early 2000s, when we were talking about rate monitoring reports, the beginning, the dawn of rate monitoring reports, and it went back two years. Why? Well, because that's when they got their system. Yeah. And so there's like a there's a distinct technological moment, or like their second or third system, but they turned them over every few years because that was such an immature technology. But now you can actually like record exposure information, and you can do some kind of rudimentary exposure adjustment of your premium, uh, and so derive at a, at a at a somewhat robust rate change figure. And that was new, and you know that is like a very important tool for a casualty reinsurer right now to go in and out of a deal or or you know on level uh, loss history and and project the future. Where I mean. It has to have had some effect, i got to think, yeah. in dealing uh, with the pricing uh, risk. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And it, it gave, you know, I think the presence of that was part of what gave the primary companies the confidence that they knew they didn't have to buy the ring shirts. It's like, I know what I've done in pricing. It has to be better. Right? Yes. And, and I think that another point that, that you make to me is that that effect differs by line, right? So some lines are more sensitive to pricing risk and some lines are, are less so. Yeah, I mean, the, I don't know if where we want to get... Um, the sort of the story let's by do line. It. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's do the story by line. So, you know, we, it looks like we've got this sort of level playing field because when, when we look in total, I, I should also point out if you're wondering why have I got this uptick here and I'm flat here, um, the byline view is direct and uh, the other view is net. So there's a little bit of a difference there between the direct and net views, but, you know, broadly it's, it's, it's in line. When we look at it by line, though, we see this, you know, so down here we've got the total, and this is all sort of very stable. Virtually no other line is, is stable, right? So the, these are showing um, direct premium to GDP split out by the major lines of business. Um, the sort of closest we get to someone who, who was sort of behaved, you know, you know, at least in a monotonic way is homeowners, right? And homeowners obviously has had, it's been dinged by, Andrew Northridge, and then, you know, other hurricane cats. And then ironically, after 2004, 2005, we had all these hurricanes. Then there was a very long period with no cat three or greater making landfall. But we just dinged to death with, you know, severe convective storm and hur tornado hurricanes, right? So that drove kind of massive uh, rate needs on the, on the homeowner's side. Um, but no, none of these other lines really looks kind of like you would expect, right? They're, they're just like all over the place. Mm -hmm. And there's some broad family, you know, connections. So, you know, got your basic liability here, um, you know, but you've got an auto cycle. So personal auto and then commercial auto sort of are correlated. But in a, you know, commercial auto in particular has been a very difficult line, very stressed for a lot of people. Um, but, but possibly no wonder, right? You gave up here, what's that, from about eight tenths of a, eight tenths, nine tenths of a point of, uh, of premium there out of uh, commercial auto. 
financial guarantees, obviously, on a sort of whole different scale <laughs> with the uh, events that happened there. Meg Mal, you know, after the sort of giant crisis has had favorable, you know, tort form and whatnot, favorable development, has sort of been a down and down story. So each so line this, a, a different story. Th these are premium to GDP. So this, so the, the thing I'm getting out of this is seeing how, I mean, the sign like of the slope of the different lines of business um, and much less the magnitude is just so different. I mean, it's, it's incredible how diverse they are. Yes. Very, uh, very and homeowners is a share of GDP. That's kind of fascinating. Um, and it's flat for the last little period of time. But, you know, I've heard stories about how, uh, you know, maybe that's a maybe that's an asset price thing. Maybe that's just like the homes are worth more because people put their money into their homes. Is that, you know? Well, homes have gotten bigger. Um, yeah. You know, homes have gotten bigger. People have moved to coastal states with a higher exposure. Um, construction, uh, you know, issues, of, and then a lot of it was sort of just overhang, just catch up on the, on the, on the rate. When modeling came in, I remember doing a rate level indication for Florida when I first started, sort of after Andrew with, um, with Cat Modeling Incorporated. And if I recall, even before you got to the hurricane load, it was just woefully inadequate. And then the hurricane load was like a hundred percent on top of. Uh, yeah. no, no one had been thinking about what the uh, appropriate rates were then. Yeah, and the the one that m maybe you know just because because some of these are small scale. Like if you look at, I mean, I don't know, what, like a med mouse kind of small, but you know, workers comp. Wow, like, you know, what happened? <laughs> yeah, so workers comp. Um, it, it's interesting to look at these lines uh, in in terms of the growth. Uh, so how how have they grown uh, relative to GDP? So this is indexing everything back to 1992. So let's just go back and look at the total picture, right? So 92 is about here, okay? We were industry, we were about three and a half percent of GDP and now we're about three, right? So we know overall, if we look at all these lines, on average, we've sort of fallen somewhat behind GDP, right? And that's what we're showing here. So this is the total and you can see, yeah, sure enough, we've fallen somewhat behind the, the GDP growth um, that we've had, which is what you'd expect. But look how different they are by uh, line again. So these are sorted by their average growth rates, if I recall. Um, and so work comp is by far, has had by far the slowest growth mm. overall through this period. Now, some of this could be people taking comp out of the traditional insurance sector and sort of you know, self-insuring and whatnot, large, large deductibles, what have you. But it is interesting that, um, so the, the uh, the, the solid black line here is the total premium growth, just so you've got that for context. The dotted line is GDP growth, uh, and then the colored line is the line of business. And then on this one in particular, I just added uh, levels of employment because it looks like comp has actually tracked somewhat closer to employment growth uh, rather than uh, sort of nominal monetary growth, which when you think about all the you know, claim inflation and what have you is actually kind of stunning. You would have thought it would have outstripped that pretty substantially. But I think the other dynamic you've got going on here is that, um, you know, we all, the average job has just gotten safer. It's yeah, right. It's easier for working in an office than it is working on a construction, uh, you know, construction site. Yep. Yeah. Uh, financial guarantee, obviously one that sticks out as being weird. Uh, 2008 is kind of like maybe the only event in the history of that business. That's probably wrong, but the biggest one by the way yeah yeah financial guarantee well and we'll see a couple of other examples and financial guarantee includes i include mortgage guarantee in here as well so yeah you can see sort of giant spike there making up for, for the losses homeowners has been you know on on the inexorable march other than financial guarantee that's had the fastest overall growth driven just by the sort of uh, climate realities that we're we're going through uh inland marine is is a lot of property coverages uh in there as well liability got the big um you know Big, big cycle that you see over time. Um, commercial auto, again, falling behind, uh, way behind. And, and you would think, you know, I, I think part of this catch up is sort of us moving now to a sort of delivery economy, which again, mm. 20 with, with COVID and whatnot, I think it's, it's sort of spiked up even more. Um, and personal auto, you can see a sort of tracks with commercial auto, but personal auto much more rational. Personal auto, you, you know, tracking that pretty much with, um, uh, with with the uh, old total is such a big part of the total, obviously, and tracking reasonably well with uh, with GDP growth as well. And, and more recently, in the auto lines, I think you had these the, sort of like the 
I don't know, yin and yang developments of smartphones on the one hand, uh, distracted driving, and then on the other hand, smartphone components, which are adding intelligence to the cars themselves, right, which are having a, a good effect. Yeah, I mean, I, the, I, my personal view is that the, the long-term prospect for personal auto is that we will get to, you know, no accidents, somewhat extreme. But if I want to get a rise out of people, I say no accidents. Right? Just look at what's happened on the aviation industry right now. We can transport billions of people with no fatalities in the airlines industry. Right? It happened, it's happened, there's been several years where there have been zero passenger fatalities in the U.S., and in you know, mostly Europe, North America. Um, so airlines has gotten incredibly safe. And I, I think as people, I, I, don't, I think there's a little bit of a, um, not thinking outside the box enough as we imagine what's gonna happen with driverless car technology. Um, it, it's not a bunch of independent cars driving around anymore. It'll be a network of communicating yeah. cars. They'll be able to anticipate what they're each gonna do. No one will be doing anything irrational. Uh, we'll be able to learn from mistakes um, I'm sure there'll be the odd, you know, systematic com colossal screw up that will happen. But overall, I think, uh, you know, as that technology comes online, we're going to see um, very positive impacts on uh, commercial auto and then, you know, on, on trucking as well. Right? The, the ability to have sort of convoys of, of, with drivers that aren't going to fall asleep uh, on these very long haul and it's very grueling as a, as a job to do, right? Very challenging. Um, and, and sort of ideal for a computer to just sit there and, you know, pay full attention at all times. Yeah, and drunk driving and, you know, as things like autopilot or whatever that comes, you know, just taking kind of some of that human judgment error out of it. Um, I agree. And I can plug another Not A Reasonable podcast with uh, Haas Highway Lost Data uh, Institute where I've, uh, uh, I'm going to be releasing a video, actually, of a time I did with them. So stay tuned, audience. Um, what do we got next, Steve? We want to, can, we, can we see this? Can we see the eras yet? I really want to see the eras grow. Okay, okay. so, so this is a precursor to the eras. This is the other thing that you might look at, right? Why do we why do we worry about all this volatility and, and why do we need surplus so that we've you know got the cushion to pay the claims? This is how surplus uh, has varied to GDP, and I, I think I mentioned that mm. seventy four was was kind of the low point there uh, on on the sort of level of policyholder surplus to, to GDP. And that's been just sort of rising pretty much as a, a straight line since then as we've gotten more reserve intensive uh, casualty lines, we've got more assets uh, on, on the insurance company balance sheet. And you can put these two things together. This is actually John uh, Major tipped me off to this. I'd never thought of doing this. So if we look at on the X axis here, surplus to GDP, and on the Y axis, the premium to GDP, and just sort of plot out the points, they naturally kind of cluster into three Amazing. periods. You've got a period from inception in the 30s. Now, I only have the surplus data back to 1930. I don't have the premium data. So from, from the 30s through 68, you're, you're in this sort of period of, you know, lower level of penetration into the economy, right? So the premium to GDP ratio is somewhat lower and the, the sort of surplus to GDP level sort of medium, right? So it's so, a so fairly well capitalized period. Between 68 and 69, you jump over into what I call phase two. And this is this sort of period where we were looking to find coverage, expand insurance, grow, you can see that was done on relatively low levels of capitalization, right? The surplus of GDP ratio here sort of in the one and a half range, historically uh, much lower than it was through much of the prior uh, period, but decent levels of uh, premium, con in growing levels of uh, premium to GDP in, into the economy. And then between 85 and 86, we had that big jump that we saw on, on the first chart, and that takes us over into what I call phase three, which has been this sort of period of consolidation, maybe greater concentration on solvency and sort of, you know, responsibility, if you will. Uh, and and that, that pushes us, you know, we, we, we've been in that period uh, since 86. If you just highlight that period on the right-hand side here, so this is just to sort of zoom in. Um, it's slightly different though, because I was wondering, well, what, um, can we predict where is premium to GDP going to go, right? This is mm -hmm. something that you'd, you'd be interested in. Well, and, and this is contemporaneous. This is this year's surplus to GDP against this year's premium to GDP. But on the right-hand side here, I'm going to show prior year-end surplus to GDP because that could be something that would then influence premium in the coming year. And you can actually see that the, you know, phase three dots, they tighten up and they fall really quite nicely along a regression line here linking the two variables. In fact, the R squared for that 
uh, regression is about 86 percent so it's a pretty good regression and you can see you know that there's no extreme outliers there the, the dots are sort of fairly well distributed uh, across the two sides it's a pretty good looking regression it's got very nice uh, statistics and going back to our question that you know we began with about well what's happened to the cycle are we gonna are we gonna continue to see the cycle this very clearly says if you want premium to jump up you're gonna need uh, surplus to fall down right it's, 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 yep. it's very clearly stating that and so we go back to our explanation of why we haven't seen big spikes in premium is because there's that capital kind of sitting on the edge waiting to be deployed that essentially stops this uh, surplus from falling too much because new capital comes into the industry. Well, it, it's in some ways it's like, I think, uh, intellectually sacrilegious, maybe, Steve, because, uh, <laughs> right, because you're kind of like throw out the manual on exposure rating or anything, right? In terms of rate levels, because all you're saying that, you know, whether you like it or not, all that really matters is whether you made money last year <laughs> um, or, or kind of the last, what are the last five years? What are, this is like an old mentor of mine used to say, well, what are the last five years? And then uh, now, we're, now we, I can tell you what the sentiment is gonna be like next year. And it kind of has nothing to do with anything else. You can't feel pain, right? Uh, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can talk a market, but you can't talk it in any direction. Well, yeah, I really think that's it. But I mean, you're you're exper you're not throwing the manual out. The manual is based on the last five years' experience as well. Right? Sure, so fine. It's been at the same, you know. Consistent but like, same. I mean, exposure rating. So exposure rating has this has this sort of like higher kind of calling, right? You made the point earlier about the property cat rates. Um, you know, where like there's something there's some there's, there's something called a unit of risk which exists, and we can measure that. You know, Don Mango uh, has, you know, he says lots of interesting things about, you know, units of risk with Internet, Internet of Things devices and the like, um, where if you could measure risk, call it, you know, first define it, then measure it directly. Now you can tell actually how much you should charge for something. So it's independent of results. There's, there's like this platonic ideal of what the right rate is, and uh, which is independent of your results. Um, and you just have to go towards that right rate. Do you agree with that? It's possible. Given your so I think there is something for, you know, uh, personal auto and uh, in several lines, but I don't think there's such a thing in catastrophe reinsurance because I think it would be like saying, hey, there's a right value for a stock. And we know that, you know, the value yeah. for a stock can range enormously. Because you look at cat reinsurance, the premium is somewhere between two and five times the expected loss, right? You see loss ratios in the sort of 20 to... 40% uh, percent range. So the risk premium in there is a very, very substantial piece of the whole. So I think that platonic ideal works um, in some lines, in some areas, and it doesn't work so well in other areas. I think in other areas, you, you just need to bring in sort of market forces to, to tell you what your premium is gonna be. You know, another interesting point about this graph is that it doesn't include the alternative capital, right? So surplus wouldn't be measured there, I wouldn't think. Uh, because that winds up getting reinsured and that's outside the system. So how does that play into uh, into the story, do you think? Well, it, yeah, so I, that's, that's something I've, so this, uh, these slides you mentioned at the beginning that is, is this pricing insurance risk course. I, I've been spending a lot of time with John on the book sort of thinking about that and thinking about how to, how to uh, price, it's pricing for risk is what we're talking about. We're not mm -hmm. talking about doing predictive modeling and getting to the loss cost. We're, we're sloughing that off on someone else and assuming that heavy lifting has been done. We just want to like gross it up to, to get to a premium. And um, reinsurance is really interesting because it sort of, I, I, although I'd spent, you know, I spent 13 years selling reinsurance and I was all over that reinsurance is capital. I fully believe that, I mean, it is, it is a form of capital. Um, but I had never really thought about, it, it's sort of in, in what, it, what, what is capital? When we talk about capital, kind of what do we mean? And what we generally mean is we've got a unit of risk here and I need to, my, my regulator tells me, and my regulator, my rating agency, they tell me how much assets I need to support that risk, right? So, so to, to credibly issue this insurance policy, I need a certain amount of assets, which is, which is the left-hand side of your balance sheet, and you need to finance it, right? So you need to, and how do you finance it? You've got two sources of financing. You've got premium you're gonna collect from your insureds, and then you've got an equity that is paid into your entity by your investors. And why do the, investors pay in equity because they are buying the residual value of the firm, right? And so that, that's sort of the, you know, the high level if you've got an all equity balance sheet. Now, if you bring reinsurers in, what do reinsurers do? Reinsurers buy the residual 
in a specific sort of subset of your book. And it could be a whole account quota share, it could be on everything, but it could be just a sort of cat layer or what have you. And one of the reasons that reinsurance is a little tricky to get your arms around is that it doesn't get booked on the balance sheet in an explicit way. So you can't, although you, know, you do gap accounts, you do gross reserves and you do, you know, you, you do gross premium and, and then you net out the, the session. So it's sort of quasi gross, but you never gross your balance sheet up to reflect the limit that you've purchased sure. on, through reinsurance, right? Yep. So what would actually be, and, and, you know, and you can see that sort of more in some areas than others. You get the Florida homeowners where you get these very reinsurance dependent little companies it actually would be much more uh, informative to be able to look at a balance sheet that, that grows that up. And for some types of reinsurance, you can do it. It's pretty easy. CAT in particular, you know, I buy $100 million of CAT limit. It's basically $100 million of capital, and I just plug it into my capital structure. But as you said, you know, I do a casualty quota share that's maybe sort of unlimited and multi-year. and da, da, da. It's not obvious exactly kind of how I would do that. And so I think for good reason, you know, the accountants don't do that. But it is, it would be it would make a lot of things clearer if we could actually do that. And yeah, it would change the dynamics here because obviously there's, you know, there's about a hundred billion dollars of alternative capital out there supporting, you know, a pretty good proportion of the, of the cat reinsurance market. At this point. Yeah, so there are a couple of ideas there that, that I really like talking about. So the metaphor I like to use for reinsurance is that it shrinks the insurance company for a given capital base, right? So there's just sort of less of everything in it, assets and liabilities. And I think that, so that's kind of one thing I like to say. Another thing that, um, uh, I like to point out is, you know, your comment there about not treating the limits of reinsurance, uh, you know, explicitly, to me, kind of shoots an arrow right at the heart of the kind of the miracle of insurance, right? And the miracle of insurance is that you don't count your limits. You ask the actuary what you should book as your liability, and that's what goes in there, right? And so, you know, you can destroy risk in kind of a very real accounting sense. You know, if a non-insurance company uh, writes an insurance policy, they call it a loan, and they put a liability in their balance sheet for the equal to the limit of the loan or whatever you want to call it, all right, the insurance company can sort of wave that away. Um, and so they ignore limits, which is kind of the heart of the whole thing. Well, that gets to why insurance works, right? I, I yeah. mean, uh, it, it's a, people love to say there's no free lunch. If there, it, I think actually there is a free lunch, and it's diversification. Sure. Diversification, because you can pull risk essentially costlessly, and you absolutely all benefit from that. And I, I think one of the big an important distinctions in insurance is lines that truly diversify well mm. and lines that don't. And we know what they are, right? It's if, if you're a cat line, you do not diversify well, and it just doesn't work brilliantly within your typical equity-based insurance company balance sheet. And that's why people want to offload that type of risk to sort of different investors, different appetites, different structures and what have you. Whereas personal auto, you know, whichever way you look at it, that is how many cars are there? 150 million vehicles or something in this country that are, you know, they are largely independent, right? And they are not all going to go and have an accident at the same time. And in fact, you know, the weather gets really bad. It's great. People stop driving. They, you know, the, the worst of the worst is that you get some snap storm that comes through after morning rush hour. Everybody's got to drive home. But mostly you can see the weather coming. It's going to be terrible. You know, on truly bad weather days, the, the, the order results get better because everyone stays at home. Um, so, yeah, it, it, the limit goes away because, you, you know, an equity insurance company true, is a brilliant structure for bearing that type of diversifiable risk. But it is not a good structure for bearing risk that doesn't diversify. And, you know, that's why we have such a vibrant uh, reinsurance market. Because yeah, they it, can have different investors that can bear that risk more effectively. And I want to kind of try and tie this back to this graph because... You know, what would the impact of this alternative capital be? So you know, capital, for the most part, is taking out these undiversifiable risks, which I think is the story that you might endorse. Then um, you're going to wind up with less volatile surplus, I suppose. Although we have this puzzle about the cat risk, the non-diversifiable risk, which kind of not seeming to really matter. So, like, if you put it this way, if you pulled alternative capital out of the system, would your regression change? Um, or if you tripled it? I think the line would shift upwards to the north, uh, the northeast, right? Because you would have more premium um, because this is net premium, right? So if you didn't have so much reinsurance, you'd be, you'd be keeping that premium and you would have to have more surplus. 
uh, I'm not sure what would happen to the slope. Right. Because that would still be affected by your prospective profit, I yeah. guess, or whether or not you made money, whether you got it right. You know, you can think of like um, the slope as being a kind of index of surprise, maybe, or something, right? So it's like, how surprising am I finding results? Um, yeah, it's, it's partly an indicator of uh, sort of cap is capital adequacy, right? I mean, so you've sort of got premium to surplus. Basically, premium to surplus ratio is the, is the slope. So I think we only got a few minutes left, Steve. So like, let's talk about what we take from all this for pricing insurance risk. What do we, what do we, how do we use all this fascinating uh, history? So I think we need to learn that um, we've got, we talk about the insurance market and it's not a single market. It's, mm -hmm. it's quite complicated. You've got, a, there's the personal commercial distinction. I think more accurately, you've got a sort of mass market specialty market distinction uh, in mass market you're tending to deal with customers who they don't have a they don't expect to have a claim and so it's very much a transactional purchase it's, it's impersonal there's very few interactions with the insurance company during the year they can move around uh, and you're rating off proxy business brand is super important because it's it's a it's a you know let's face it no one wants to buy insurance right it's not the top of anyone's agenda to go out and shop for insurance you want to get it done as easily as possible. So brand becomes important. Automation becomes important. We've got that sort of side of the, the market. Um, even there, we saw with personal auto, right? We've had swings, but not, not so much. Then we've got the commercial line side, which sort of splits into a piece of that is like your uh, personal lines in that, you know, it's the sort of small commercial side um, w with the same type of rating technology. And then you've got the larger risks where, Gradually, you know, risk load becomes a, a more important factor as you're providing to a high limit property and what have you. But they tend to have claims year o, you know, year over year that they're, they're carrying a body of claims over, maybe makes them sort of stickier. Um, so I, I think, it, you know, it, understanding that the different lines have different drivers and going back to sort of where I started as we think about pricing, you know, the risk, you've got event risk and cat risk, which is very real and, and can't be run away from, but property driven. You've then got the risk that you, you know, we know all the pre, we know what the premium should be. We, we know Don Mango's platonic ideal, but can we get it in the market? Which kind of comes down to people are, have a tendency to push the granularity of pricing right up to, to breaking point. Um, and then you've got lines where you, you don't know the premium. I guess probably, uh, you know, the financial lines in the, Mid two thousands was it was a great example of that. We thought we did, but in fact, you know, maybe we didn't have such a good good idea. And there's a series of uh, slides. You know, I, I guess we're about halfway through uh, what I thought we might talk about today, which is fine. I mean, this has been a great conversation, but I think if we do part two of this, we can dig into some of those drivers by line of business and see some very interesting things in terms of different behaviors on the loss side and the premium side. They really sort of inform how people underwrite in those lines and how they think about selling and how your loss ratio, as we think about sort of loss ratio volatility, is it, it's driven by loss and premium, right? And you need to separate those two things out and look at those different dynamics. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a great idea, Steve. Um, inviting yourself back into my show, uh, but <laughs> I'll take it. Um, and so we'll hold on that. But I do think that there is potentially some macro conclusions we can draw from this because you just have to kind of, I mean, you got a regression line there, Steve. So if we extrapolate this line, right, what we will see is we will see that premium to GDP will continue to decline, right? That's one thing we'll see, right, um, over time. And are there, what does that kind of mean? Uh, does that mean that we, uh, without the surplus GDP declining though, somehow that's going to continue increasing. So that means like probably a narrowing of the return on capital is gonna continue dropping, right? If that keeps going, what else can we, infer well i i think what we're inferring is that if we are expecting that to be a big change in premium it needs to be driven by a capital event that's the the big takeaway here right so if we're thinking we're currently at a what a three three point one five i think uh, the 2020 dot there um is between the three and three point two if you want to get back to where we were in 92 which as you can see is like three point you know five percent of gdp you, this would be suggesting that you'd need to see, you need, you'd need to take surplus to GDP down from 4% to 2.5%, which is what, 15 out of 40, which is a big old, you know, a big proportion. Um, and you can just imagine what the rating agencies would be thinking about that if we, yeah. you know, our, our surplus levels go down that much. 
So, you know, is that likely to happen? Uh, or as we think about growth in the industry, should we be thinking, hey, you know, we're, we're going to grow with GDP. And so that, you know, that has implications because it means I'm probably, if I do organic growth, I'm stealing someone else's lunch. When, and that's going to be tough. There's going to become, you know, so how am I going to develop that competitive advantage that I'm going to be able to win business? Well, we can see a couple of ways that people do that in the auto space. So we've got the inexorable march of, of Geico and uh, Progressive and, you know, low expenses, right? They, they're coming into the fight over the premium dollar and five points already in their pocket, five, more than five points in many cases um, through, through expenses. So some people have, the, you know, decided to do that. Um, other, other players are going with a cost of capital advantage. You can look at, you know, your mutuals come in and overall they kind of run in about the same, but the, the delta comes out with policyholder dividends. It gives them, um, a, you know, an, essentially an expense advantage over the stocks because they don't have to pay maybe so much for their, their cost of capital. So I think there's sort of interesting um, competitive dynamics here as well. Well, I think it's a great lead in to, to, um, to our next conversation because to me, one thing of extraordinary competition, extreme competition, which is I think what increases as you know we have benign and we have a kind of a weird thing happening right now, but I think overall um, a benign period means uh, the premium GDP will continue dropping. That means you probably nicheify many more pieces of business, and so you have to look in a really granular manner at everything. Um, but with that, we will close. My guest, Steve Mildenhall. Thank you very much, Steve. I look forward to having you back. Thank you very much. <laughs>